Welcome to the CSBP Fertilizers Grow Better podcast, sharing knowledge with growers on leading crop nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and other issues impacting the agricultural industry. G'day, everyone. Welcome to the CSBP Grow Better podcast. My name's Gray Johnston, and I'm joined today by CSBP's brand new Senior Sustainable Agriculture Advisor, Deborah Turner. Deborah, welcome. Thank you, Gray. I'm um, very pleased to be welcome to CSBP. It's really nice to have you with the business and really nice to have you on the podcast. Now, our topic today is nitrous oxide and how that relates to greenhouse gas emissions and, and all things net zero in the world of fertiliser. And this is an area where you have some particular expertise. Before we get onto that, I guess, can you just um, introduce yourself and tell us about, about your background and your role and, um, and how you ended up here at, at CSBP? Thanks, Gray. And um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be part of this podcast series and speaking to our listeners, our growers and other 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 people out there in the in the world of ag and and um, all things sustainable. So I started out um, in my ag career after doing a chemistry degree by doing a PhD in gaseous losses of nitrogen from agriculture, um, which sounds you know quite boring. But it was really exciting. I got to sort of trade in my lab coat for a pair of gumboots and go sloshing around out in the paddocks and doing lots of measurements of things like ammonia volatilization from fertilizer applications and from um, grazed pastures, as well as nitrous oxide emissions measurements, which back in the, in the day, that was in the like the early 2000s was really important because nitrous oxide is a really potent greenhouse gas. And the Australian government at the time spent quite a lot of money on a big research program to quantify uh, nitrous oxide emissions, methane emissions, as well as carbon dioxide, the, you know, the big greenhouse gas that everybody talks about. Um, and there was a huge research program that was running in Australia that I was really lucky to be a part of. So yes, I did lots of measurements of nitrous oxide emission back in the 2000s. So that was while you're doing your PhD. Yes. And then in between then and coming here, you've been involved more in the fertiliser policy space? Uh, yes. I sort of packed up my gumboots and moved overseas uh, after about 10 years of research in Australia and worked for um, in an international uh, agriculture research organisation uh, where we worked more in the developing developing countries, mm -hmm. uh, working with research organisations and governments to implement programs related to sort of soil health, soil fertility and fertilisers. And then I moved to the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation where I worked, yeah, around fertiliser policy, um, technical aspects of um, fertilisers, sort of at a kind of a global scale. And um, probably one of the bigger initiatives that I worked on was a uh, international code of conduct for the sustainable use of fertilizers. Wow, there you go. Highly relevant to them. Exactly. I guess not just our podcast today, but really clearly where we're heading at CSBP in relation to trying to make sure we can provide the best advice to our industry and to our customers on making sure they're using products efficiently and maximizing the efficiency of the use of product to optimize nutrient use efficiency and, and reduce emissions intensity of their production. So we're glad to have you with the business and I guess really glad that you can join us to talk specifically on this topic. And, and you touched a lot on um, your research background there and it would be remiss of us, I guess, not to delve into that a little more now. Can you take us to the next level around, we get that nitrous oxide is a really potent um, greenhouse gas and uh, we had Justin, uh, our field research manager on the show uh, a couple of months ago talking about some nitrogen loss pathways. Can you just dig into that a little more for us and, and talk us a little bit more through those nitrogen losses, those nitrogen emissions and and how they're relevant really to, to the growers who might be listening in? Nitrogen dynamics and the nitrogen cycle, you know, it, it's actually quite complex. And um, nitrous oxide, as Justin very nicely um, uh, explained in his podcast is produced usually through a process called denitrification. Um, and it happens when there's nitrogen in the soil, there's a source, source of organic carbon and the soil conditions uh, are, are anaerobic. 
So um, it, while losses of nitrous oxide, they're actually quite tiny um, uh, compared to other gaseous losses and also leaching. But because nitrous oxide is so potent, it's you know, 265 times more potent than carbon dioxide. You know, it's really um, important that we try and sort of curtail these emissions because they add a lot of heat to our atmosphere. So it's really important to uh, use you know best you know the best management practices you know that we know of. Uh, to try and control the conditions when you know, these emissions happen, mm -hmm. um, as well as perhaps even trying to use products to slow down these emissions by inhibiting different processes in the in the in the soil nitrogen um, cycle. So you talked there about the conditions that might be required for that nitrification and then the denitrification losses, yes. and you talked about. Uh, I think you mentioned anaerobic and you yeah. mentioned some some organic carbon put it in in more layman's terms for me what like if I'm a if I'm a grower what are the sort of conditions I might be looking at or what are the risk profile or the risk factors that might be leading to think hey I might be having nitrous oxide losses in in, in, in my enterprise well it's applications of nitrogen mm -hmm. yep so that's you know sort of kind of you know sort of a bit of a no-brainer the, the microbes need nitrogen uh, Anaerobic conditions, that's from sort of waterlogged or compacted soils and, uh, you know, weather conditions, you know, when it's warmer, you know, that it, it you know, happens more often, fertiliser placement. So then your research involved actually measuring some of those, some of those losses, some of those nitrogen losses. Can you talk us through how that works? So the, the big program that I was involved in, the CRC for greenhouse accounting, that had, you know, literally hundreds of people involved in that measurements all around the country. So there were um, several ways that we, we all measured nitrous oxide that was using um, these quite large automated chambers. They take up, you know, they cover an area of about a square meter and you place them all around the paddock. They are fully automated. They open and close at different times of the day. They're connected up to a, a gas analyzer that analyzes the, the buildup of gases in them so that you can measure these 24 seven for a couple of years at a time, quite often. Yep. So you know, very complex and expensive process. Uh, there's also uh, ways where you can sort of sample uh, gases directly from the atmosphere and um, do sort of calculations using micrometeorological data to calculate fluxes of the emissions from quite large areas. And then we had another sort of like quick and dirty way to do it, which was using like little tiny mini chambers that we would spread around the paddock and run, literally run around and sample with a syringe um, periodically to look at the sort of the variability of emissions because they're very variable because much like with um, the soil itself, it can vary considerably you know, around the paddock. And you talked there about uh, some of your experiments were going over multiple years. As I understand, that's really important to take that, that long-term perspective because a nitrification or denitrification loss then can happen completely disconnected from a, from the timing of a fertilizer application. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, you know, different, you know, particularly weather, you know, rainfall patterns. Um, if you've uh, had a, a change in um, practice, like you've changed from your cropping from, say you've had a permanent pasture and um, price of grains is high. A lot of people putting in, uh, in back in Victoria, a lot of people were putting in uh, cereal crops on top of old pastures. So we were kind of studying the, the, the change in emissions profiles from those. Tell us about uh, any research that's been done in Western Australia in this, in this space. Is there, as I understand, there may be some differences between uh, the risk of these sort of nitrous oxide losses in WA relative to, relative to other places in Australia and, and indeed across the world. Louise Barton from the University of Western Australia, she was part of that program and she did long-term measurements for you know, several years, you know, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, because of, and, and rightly predicted because of WA soils being quite nutrient poor, 
um, you know, it's quite dry. She found that uh, losses in Western Australia were, you know, were quite a bit lower than the sort of, you know, that rough ballpark global average that, um, you know, is sort of used by as a rule of thumb and for reporting for countries to report their greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm sure then that the growers out there listening to this will be saying that's all that's all very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yes. and I, I personally find it fascinating. Yes. Uh, what then, how does the rubber hit the road on this stuff? I guess there's something around emissions measurement and, and a potential carbon price down the road, but there's yes. probably something also around, I would guess if you can minimise your losses, there's a better chance that there's nitrogen available to the plant. Is that, a, is that the way we can think about it? Yeah, of course. And even with denitrification, you know, we talk about, you know, nitrous oxide, um, you know, being the, you know, the, 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 the most important part of denitrification or, or the end product, whereas in fact it's not. If nitrous oxide is further denitrified, it transforms into N2 and is lost back up into the atmosphere. And that actually can be quite a significant part of denitrification as well. So, um, you know, not only are you losing nitrous oxide, but you can be losing other end products. So, you know, no matter what, you wanna be just maximizing your efficiency of N, whether it's because it's, you, you're paying, you know, for want of a better word, for emitting greenhouse gases, or you want to save money, you know, your money in your pocket from, you know, making the most of your fertiliser. And so you went from doing this research to, as you said before, applying some of it in a, in a policy sense. What, what are the policy applications of, of this work? And, and has, there been any, has there been any great policy made as, as a result of it? I sort of picked up my bags at the end of that program and sort of took off overseas and, you know, sort of got lost in the developing world for, for quite a while. So, so within Australia, I, I mean, what happened is that the, the government took up these, these emission factors or numbers based on the, the measurements of all of these people in the, in the CRC and adjusted our emission factors so that when we report to um, the IPCC, we are, are, are not um, responsible for you know, as, as much emission as if we'd taken that 1% number. So what we're saying there is the, the work that you did or the work that you contributed to showed yes. that nitrous oxide losses in, in Australia on average yeah. are lower than, than say in Europe or North America where most of the calculations had, yeah. had previously been done. So you, I know you've only been in the role uh, six or eight weeks. Do you want to um, tell us a little bit about what you're up to and what CSBP is up to in, in, in this sort of sustainability in particular um, managing emissions from agriculture kind of space? I was really pleased that um, when I arrived at CSBP, there was already quite a big um, program and a lot of work already being done on sustainability. And in fact, uh, before I took on the job, I called up one of my old uh, friends, former colleagues from um, my work at ICADA in Jordan, who used to work for CSBP, and uh, asked him, you know, what 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 does he think? Should I move to should I move over to the move over west and uh, join CSBP? He was very supportive and said, yes, do it. CSBP have um, always supported sustainability. And then when I arrived, there was so much already being done. In fact, I feel like I'm you know, trying to just sort of catch up on what you guys are doing before I can even sort of get my head around where we you know, could be sort of like you know, pushing things even further. And, um, you know, you know, quite well, you know, we've been having lots of discussions about, um, you know, where future perhaps government regulations might step in and sort of affect not only our business, but our, our growers and how we can be um, ahead of that game and be kind of ready for anything that, 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 that happens. And, you know, one of, one of the key things that, of course, that we're focusing on and what you guys have done, you know, forever is the best use of nutrients possible. Deb, I understand you also, uh, as part of your research program, looked at um, inhibitor products, which I know can be applied to uh, address a couple of different loss pathways. And, and Justin talked about that in his previous um, in his previous podcast. What what did you learn about them when you were using them? I did one sort of quite big experiment looking at uh, the use of NBPT, a urease inhibitor, uh, combined with urea, 
and found that in the particular situation I um, I measured it in, which was to a, a cereal crop, a wheat crop, we lost 10% of the nitrogen as as um, ammonia for lateralization, whereas using the treated product, we only lost 1% of the N. So, you know, that was back um, probably almost 15 years ago. At the time, there wasn't a big appetite for farmers in the east, I was working in the east, to use these products because it was not economically viable. Urea was cheap and you know, was cheaper to lose a bit of N than to um, pay for uh, an inhibitor. Uh, whereas now I think um, it's, uh, you know, that, that, that's sort of, that's changed a bit given fertiliser prices and potential government regulations perhaps, like we're seeing you know, in Canada and Netherlands and some other places around the world where you'll have to, you know, reduce your fertilisers perhaps or reduce emissions or be more nutrient efficient. MBPT then, which is a, a component of CSBP Urea Sustain, that, uh, as you mentioned, it, it addresses losses of ammonia, which isn't a greenhouse gas in and of itself, but it can still reduce the emissions intensity of, of grain production. Is that is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, that's right. Because um, if you lose the ammonia to the atmosphere, if that's 10% or sometimes it can be, it can be more, um, you're not putting that in into your production and into your grain. So yes, the, um, you know, it's just sort of like doing the maths and balancing the books. You'll, um, you know, you'll increase your, your um, N efficiency mm -hmm. and your emissions um, intensity if you keep that N in the in the system and put it into your product. Deb, it's been a fascinating conversation and really great to learn about uh, the experience and the research you've done and, and find a little bit more about nitrous oxide and, and the ways you've measured it and, and then the ways that it's relevant to our growers here in WA. Looking forward then, as you, as you really get your, your feet into this role uh, at CSBP, what are you what are you thinking and where are you going to take us and um, and take the industry in WA? As I sort of mentioned earlier, there's you know there's sort of a lot to take in, but um, you know pretty much you know we just we want to have you know solid science um, and evidence to sort of back up our efforts to support growers to manage nutrients better and to just support the industry. In the you know in that pathway to net zero, which you know at the moment is a little bit confusing for 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 many, including me. It's yeah, uh, me. <laughs> yeah it's 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 not an it's not an easy path. There's a lot to juggle, and you know basically we just need to, as I said, get a sort of information out, gather and get information out to our growers to support them. And we're going to be doing our best to help growers measure and then monitor and manage their emissions. And, and I think really important, as you touched on before, taking that longer term view, making sure we're managing these things over, over many seasons and optimizing the program over, over a number of years so that we can be sure that things like rotations and, and things like systems trials are really more and more important um, in the context of, of what we're doing here at CSBP. Deb, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Gray. It's, it, look, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I um, hope that uh, our listeners got something out of this. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us for another edition of the CSBP Grow Better podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. And uh, of course, jump on our socials at CSBP Fertilisers and slide into our DMs with any feedback you have or suggestions for the show. That's it. Thank you, Deb Turner. I've been Gray Johnston. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gray. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the CSBP Grow Better podcast. For more information about CSBP, please visit csbp-fertilisers.com.au or connect with us on social media at CSBP Fertilisers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn.